Snowball Spark. You want good words? Data languages. Talk real sports with a real man. Come after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. And now, here's the be-all, end-all, know-it-all of high school, college, and pro sports. Aaron Skinny Count with The Skinny on Sports. We're talking about practice, man. I'm the MVP. Good Wednesday morning out there, Western Oklahoma. Welcome to the Skinny on Sports right here on 98.1 FM, the sports animal. Glad to have you along for the next hour. A little breaking news that we'll wait to the end of the show, but an injustice has been rectified. Interesting timing with this return of an award. We've got some regional baseball today. I know for sure in two locations. I know... I ask Arapaho, they're, they're tomorrow. Elk City's tomorrow. So I know for sure in two locations we got some baseball today in Class A and B regional tournaments. Also, the Great American Conference golf tournaments wrapped up. We can tell you how that worked for Swasu and also uh, a, a young lady from Cordell. And then the Big 12 men's golf tournament will be wrapping today down at Whispering Pines in Trinity, Texas. OU, Texas. And OSU all in the final group. But the Sooners and the Pokes have a long way to go to be able to challenge the horns. But a guy that's been right here on this show will tell you how he's doing. Fantastic yesterday. We'll go a little golf there at the end. NFL draft talk. I saw the Adam Schefter. So don't look up Adam Schefter, Jared. Okay. He tweeted out last night. What positions over the la- over the sample size was from the 2000 draft through the 2019 draft, right up to COVID, okay? 20 years worth of first-round picks. Which positions have been the most reliable? And by reliable, the, the, what that means is a team takes a player in the first round and that player signs a second contract with that team. Okay. So that decides if it's a hit or a miss. With the same team. With the same team. Not necessarily the longevity of that player with multiple teams. No, no, no. Just with gotcha. the like because they it's considered you hit on a player yeah. if you drafted him in the first round and, you, and he signed another contract he, with you. He got the bag. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So that that's considered a hit miss. So which positions have had the greatest hit percentage? And which ones have had the greatest miss percentage? Which then leads me down to what are the cat what are the Cowboys options at number twenty four? And so you've got this in your mind, like when I ask you that question, you probably have, okay, they need this, they need that, they need, you know, whatever what have you. Like these could be what they might take. Now, what would you say right now? And then not literally right now right now, but before <laughs> Before I give you those those uh, the Schefter stuff, okay. I'm going to ask you what would you say then, and then after hearing which positions actually hit, see if it changes your mind on what maybe the Cowboys need to do at number 24. Uh, NBA playoffs game two tonight in Oklahoma City, Thunder Pelicans. Did you hear a little Zion? All of a sudden, Zion maybe not out of the question that he could return tonight. Not tonight, oh. but before the series is over. So, does that mean the Thunder need to get her done? The faster you can beat them, the better, and that eliminates the Zion possibility. What can Oklahoma City, or can they do anything to clean up the rebounding? What adjustments do you think might be made by New Orleans and how the Thunder can handle it and then who wins and why? Last night, we actually had some road teams finally win games. We were both right. Indiana and, and the, the uh, Mavs. Are there two superstars that are hurting their teams by playing? We'll talk about that as well. So that's what we've got on the on, on the uh, plate for today. 225-9698 is the phone or the text line. That is 225-9698. Give us a call, shoot us a text. We can talk about any of those things or whatever else might be on your mind. Feel free to chime right in at 225-9698. If you're going to be outside the listening area, a couple ways to stay in touch with the show. Log on to kadsam.com or you can download the app. The app's got it all. It's got radio. It's got the Penny News. Brand new edition at the Penny News. Hit the website last night at midnight. So check out the deals through the app online, thepennynews.com. Of 
course, Big Elk and Paragon TV. Speaking of Big Elk TV, we will have updates throughout the day from the Class 4A Girls Regional Golf Tournament right here at Elk City Golf and Country Club. Our man Gabe Edney is going to have some video, has some uh, results throughout the day, so check out kind of intermittently throughout the day on BigElkTV.com. You'll see some highlight video packages from that Class 4A Girls Regional Golf Tournament here at Elk City. So that's coming up today, and then, of course, Starting tomorrow, Big Elk TV, we will have Class 4A Baseball Regional times 1.30 and 4 o'clock. Do you remember the order that the Elks play? Purcell. Purcell first and, and McLeod second. Is that right? Yeah, they play the Purcell McLeod start That's an 11 at o'clock. 11. We won't have that one. Well, no. And then we'll have the Big Elks and the Dragons at 1.30, and the other game's supposed to start at 4. Now. As we saw last year, those game times are subject to the game before them. Yeah. So, once again, how we'll do this, the same way we did it last year. If we can tell the times are going to change, we will put a message out on Big Elk TV's Facebook page that says, hey, the one thirty start time for the Big Elks and Purcell will not happen. And then, of course... Instead of like, just here's all we'll have to do. We'll just wait on them to tell the official game time. Right. We'll just say, hey, it's been pushed back. We'll update you when we know what the official game time will be. That's just the easiest way to do it. And You'll then as, know when we know. Yeah, and as soon yeah. as we, as soon as the the coaches get together, if it if it is delayed a little bit because of the game before, and, and as soon as they get together, decide how much warm up time they need when the game when the official game time will be. We'll post that on the Big Elk TV Facebook page, and everybody will know at the same time. So that's, I mean, that's the the only way really we can do it. There's no, first off, we haven't uh, been cleared to turn the camera on to watch the last two innings of the game before us through yeah, the OSSA. Yeah, we we literally that. can't do that. We will get in trouble. That's right. So that's how we're going to have to do it. But once again, today, we'll have video highlights of the Class 4A Girls Regional out at Elk City Golf and Country Club. Then tomorrow, baseball. How are you today, Jared? I'm good. How are you? Just wonderful. You're, wonderful. In, a good, you're in a good mood. I like you it. know, I tell you what, I woke up this morning. I, was, I planned. My wife and I walked a little bit. We had, we've kind of been off, off the walking kick since we got back from the Masters. I've been meaning to ask, did that pay off? Oh, Ooh. my gosh. I don't know how to have done it if I wouldn't have been <laughs> good, prepared. Good. Um, so we kind of took a week off, or I took a week off. She's still running and stuff. But So last night, got back out there. Uh, last evening after we ate supper and i don't know probably went a quarter of a mile or so and all of a sudden i could tell i haven't been walking <laughs> it felt like my calf muscles were going to burst through the skin in the back of my legs i told her i said she goes which way you want to go i said we have to go home <laughs> my calves are burning they feel like they're about to burst through the skin and she was like oh, okay i said it's just a warm-up maybe we can do it in the morning so then i woke up this morning and it was pouring down rain yeah so anyhow didn't wasn't able to get out there this morning but uh you know it looks like maybe the wind's going to be blowing a little bit for the girls out there at the golf tournament but cool cloud cover at least for a while you know what you need on rainy days it, my wife bought one of these a walking pad it's not a treadmill but it's a walking pad hmm. and she walks on that i just don't like it she comes home at noon and walks and then she does it after work, so twice a day. I don't know how long. I mean, it measures how long, the length, the distance. I guess. I just, I just, I never liked the. Tra I just never liked the I, I like option. to get out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like, get out and check things. I, you know, my favorite thing is before anybody is up. Really, you know, if, if we're out there at six fifteen, just go walk yeah. the golf course. It's so peaceful. Oh, you know. Uh, that's that's really what I like to do, but we couldn't do it this morning. Well, she likes to uh, watch suits and walk. Oh yeah, well there you go. <laughs> so, all right. Last night, so let's rehash what happened a little bit in the NBA playoffs before we get to the Thunder game. Finally, road teams win. I think it ended up being twelve in a row with uh, Minnesota defeating Phoenix in the first game of the night. I thought the Grayson Allen ankle injury. Spelled doom for the Suns. I think it was 52-52 when he went out with the ankle. 
and then the Suns were outscored 53-35 without him. Uh, once again, third quarter. Do you think that'd be a thing? Not Grayson really. Allen was the reason they – because he wasn't there is why they lost. Well, it makes sense though because they are so thin anyway. Yeah, that's that, true. You know, a, an injury like that then that forces all those guys. It's just, man, it just doesn't seem like it works with those three. Those three guys, it just doesn't. It, it's like they need another facilitator to get them the basketball, and they just don't have that. But I will also say this: Minnesota was by far and away the best defensive team in the league this year. Mm-hmm. They have guys, obviously everybody knows about Go Bears, the defensive player of the year, four years or what have you. You know, Towns is kind of suspect, but their perimeter dudes with Jaden McDaniels, you know, Ant will guard you. Uh, oh, what's his name? Alexander Walker. They, 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 man, they, they have guys that really buy in defensively. And I think that's part of the reason why not only – that. It just Phoenix looks so discombobulated at times where it really looks like it turns into a your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn with those three guys mm-hmm. on the floor at the same time. There, it just doesn't seem like there's any cohesion whatsoever with that Phoenix offense. But I give a lot of credit to Minnesota on the defensive end. Yeah, you know, I think Rudy gets a lot of credit for that, for – yeah, he's a, a master at defense, but I think those guys kind of feed off that. I think that's kind of what you're saying, too. They see that and and, and feed off of that. But Phoenix, it's it's not working. It's, I think, you know, I was thinking, I know it's just 2-0, but, you know, on the text line, Jeremy says about getting swept. I mean, it's very possible, which is crazy to think when you got a, we got a team with KD on it that they could be swept. But does this feel like, it kind of does to me, you know, we knew the beginning of the super team era was Miami and LeBron and Dwayne, or and Wade and Botch. But does this feel like this is the end of the super team era? Like this is the nail in the coffin? Like it's not working. It, it it's a changing of the guard. The, you know, we've talked about swings of uh, of different eras, and we've talked about that over and over about this the names and the stars. You know, the the stars are getting older. And the new ones are coming into the league. But now even the way teams are being built, I think, will be reconsidered. Like the Phoenix thought, we're going to do everything we can. We're going to put all our chips into the middle. We're going to get KD. We're, we have nothing to back up on now. We're going all in, and it's not working. It's like a cautionary tale. It's it's like the rest league, I, th- I think, my opinion, are going to look at that and go, that's not how we do it. You can't do it like this anymore. It's just not how the league works anymore. I don't think you can do I, – I think it can still happen. But I think you're. I, I think the contracts have to be staggered. Like right now, you've, you're talking about three dudes, yeah. that are on you oh, know toward yep. the end of their. But they're on as high as you can get, right? I, I think you need to to be able to stagger a little bit, like what OKC has kind of stumbled into here. Yes, Chet and J Dub are going to get the max, but they're not going to get the SGA max, right? They get the rookie max, mm-hmm. so you you don't have all of your eggs tied up in that three man basket. You know, if, if you have them, you have them, and I don't know what you do about that. But it's definitely showing, and, you know, I, I know Jim's been harping against what the Thunder are doing as far as playing as many guys as they've been playing. But to your point, I think that that may be something that teams start to look at because what is Phoenix lacking? They, I mean, they have zero bench, especially without Grace. I mean, where are their guys? Well, their guys had to be shipped out in order to acquire Kevin Durant. And it does seem like it, it seems like everybody's trying to get two right now, mm-hmm. two guys, and then that that allows them to not since you don't have three, then that allows to supplement those two guys with people that fit around them. I, I think that might be the change that that you're noticing or that that we we all start seeing is especially you know if it's older guys that command more money because of what they've done in the league. I don't think you can get three of them because once you get three, then they better be A, healthy, and B, fit completely perfectly together. Otherwise, you're not able to supplement them with guys behind them, not only in the starting lineup, but, of course, off the bench. And so, you know, and and what does it take a lot of times to get those guys? It takes what you need to supplement, and that's draft picks. Yeah. You're not able to get better players on cheap contracts 
in the draft to help with that because you had to ship them out in order to to gain the superstar. And I, so I I think you might see that. I think it may still be kind of up in the air, depending on let's say what what L.A. what the Clippers do. The Clippers are obviously on that super team track with Harden and Kawhi and Paul George, but you know them that they're kind of it's kind of a dying breed a little bit with the way teams are being built. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the other games, uh, Indiana. I kind of alluded to thinking that they would have a chance with against a Giannisless Milwaukee. Was Dame's you know outburst sustainable? Is there enough help outside of him? Once again, he killed it in the first half and did nothing in the second half. Ends up with 34 on 10 of 21, which looks like a nice night. 6 of 13 from 3, but uh, Indiana. Pascal Siakam, a career-high 37 in the playoffs, 16 of 23. The, the game was played more at Indiana's pace, where they're scoring thirty in at least 30 in every quarter. And if that happens, I don't know that Milwaukee can hang with the firepower that, that Indiana has possesses I, I think last night's game may be more of what we see as opposed to the first uh, in game one throughout this series because once again I mean Indiana I think ended up closed as a favorite to win this series without Giannis with the Bucks. I think last night you kind of saw why people thought that um and they were able to you know just not quite enough help for Dame yeah I I like Dame but it we talk about the uh, you know the teams that are how they're built, and that's how that is like a two man prong there. And Milwaukee's clearly missing Giannis, but give Indiana credit. I don't know if, I mean maybe if Giannis was there, that's a different story. But that that's a big win for them and shifts back to Indiana. And then Before, finally, yeah. yeah, finally the last night, the the last game of the night with Dallas and the Clippers. This game. Kind of back and forth, back and forth. You know, there was times where it looked like the Clippers were going to run away and hide. Then all of a sudden, Dallas would make a run, <clears throat> and um, you know, Luca just Luca and Kyrie are really good, and I think for me, I think that Kawhi. Is doing did more harm than good last night because he's clearly not a hundred percent. Clearly, the way he's moving. I mean, Luca locked him down on a couple of possessions, and that's not possible if Kawhi Leonard is healthy enough to be out there. And so, I would almost submit to you that Kawhi being out there hurt the Clippers' chances last night of taking a two nothing lead. A little bit like Philly with Embiid. That's when I bring up are those two superstars that aren't at their total max capabilities actually hurting their teams. I don't know if that's happening with Embiid because they don't really have anything like him, and so everything you're getting from him is better than none. But in this situation, I felt like the Clippers, they're as good as they looked in Game 1 and, and the continuity that they had in Game 1 really felt disjointed last night with, the re, with re, the, not only the return of Kawhi, but not really Kawhi. It's like he's taken a spot of a healthier player that can contribute, and that's weird to say because we're talking about Kawhi Leonard, but he's not 100% clearly. And and who could fill in that role? I mean, maybe who, who started in his place? Was it Plumlee? Was it Westbrook? Who started in his place? I'm not sure. But I can see what you're saying. I mean, the, the Embiid thing is totally different because he's such a specimen. You, you need him out there. But Leonard – I don't mean this in a mean way. Is replaceable if he's not healthy, and that does kind of kind of put L.A. in a bad spot, especially against a team like Dallas that has Luca and Kyrie, who are clearly healthy and, and really good when they're really good together. I, I mean, fifty-five combined points. How do you stop that? You, know, you can't when you're hobbled like Kawhi is. Yeah, uh, Amir Coffee is who started in Game okay. One. Okay. And then, you know, last night played 12 minutes. Which is smart because Westbrook's found a new mm -hmm. career in coming off the bench. I don't think it's smart to start him. Russ was terrible last night, yeah, two of nine. He was not good. Nine rebounds, three assists, seven points. He was a plus eight while he was out there, but he didn't, you know, it just it, it just felt a little bit different with the, with the Clippers, and they couldn't really kind of figure things out. And, and like I said, Kawhi, defensively, you didn't notice it much just because the Clippers are really good defense. 
offensively is where he just didn't have any explosion to get around to get around Luca. I mean, come on, <laughs> that's that that is a, not a good sign for the health of that knee when he's not explosive enough to to leave Luca behind because we all know Luca Doncic is not a good defender. You know, we talked about yesterday. Uh, mentioned Harden and his always kind of lackluster performance in the playoffs. What do you think about him? And back to what Harden normally is. And, but I think you see this a lot of times outside of LeBron James with older players in the playoffs, especially once they start going every other night. Mm-hmm. You start to see you know, they, their bodies don't recover. And so you know, normally you know, that extra day off really helps some of these older guys. I'm sure that Dallas made some adjustments to try to <coughs> get the ball out of his hands a little bit more. You know, 6 of 14 doesn't look too bad. Scoring 22, but 2 of 10 from 3 does. And, you know, that also to me tells a story of not being able to have enough juice to get around guys, to get in the paint. He did get he did shoot 9 free throws, but to settle, I would call it settle for 10 for 10 threes instead of getting into the mid-range or even to the rim. I think that tells you a little bit that that Harden maybe not feeling quite as spry in game two as he was in game one. And I think that's just something that you kind of see. Uh, that's why, yeah. you know, these older guys, you know, it, sometimes they just shoot the lights out and that happens. But it, you kind of start seeing inconsistencies out of these guys in playoff series from game to game once they get north of 30 and even to, to the 35-year-old age, uh, age range. That's just the way it goes. All right, tonight, Thunder and Pelicans game two. How how or can the Thunder clean up the uh, defensive rebounding that was obviously a bugaboo and almost cost them game one? I mean, rebounding is so tricky. I mean, we've called a lot of games, and there's sometimes you just see a rebound happen, it's just a bounce of the ball. You know, sometimes you, the players are in good position, and it just goes – those long bounces, those long rebounds. I think there's a sequence or two in game one. That was kind of the case, but – it's still the league. You got to get a hand on it or something. I don't know how. Uh, I mean, Giddy's got to do better. You mentioned that. He's got to do a mm-hmm. lot better rebounding. It can't be all Chet. Uh, but even times Chet has fingers on it, he's not. he wasn't bringing it in. I'll equate that to being nervous, um, you know, adrenaline, whatever you want to call it. But but Chet needs help. Giddy needs to get more involved. Yeah, I think Giddy is a huge part of this. I think we'll probably see more J Dub for rebounding purposes mm-hmm. um, to try to battle with Valentinus. To me, the easiest way for this to work and for this to be is for Chet to make shots because if he can knock down threes, that puts Valentinus on the bench because Willie Green has to go with somebody else on the defensive end yeah. to combat what Chet can do. And so if, if he can knock down. You know, three or four threes, not necessarily right at the first, but throughout the first half, then that maybe that makes Willie Green change what he's doing from a rotational standpoint, and that gets Valanciunas off the floor because twenty rebounds in game one, nine of those on the on the offensive glass. Oklahoma City has nobody that can really challenge him from a physical standpoint. I mean, he's just like Paul Bunyan out there. That when you see him, he just looks like a totally different dude than anybody else out on the floor. And so I, I really think, in a lot of ways, being for Chet offensively is the key to getting him off the floor, and then that immediately has to help with everything else as far as the rebounding goes. I agree 100% about Giddy. You know, he's not reliable necessarily from a scoring standpoint, but at his size at 6'8", uh, you know, maybe he's a he's going to have to not be as soft. You know, I think that's clear. He's more of a finesse type player. Mm-hmm. New Orleans isn't a finesse type team. There is a they're as physical as anybody in the league, and so that's going to have to be something he meets the challenge at. And he can't have three or four rebounds. He needs to be in that eight to ten range for the Thunder to maximize that whatever their ability is on the boards to combat what what New Orleans does. But I, I think it's Giddy B, but A. I, I think the easiest way is for Chet to make shots and prove to Willie Green that Valanciunas can't guard him. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm right there with you. What do you think adjustments we might see out of New Orleans defensively? Well, I don't know. I, I, 
I'm trying to think who they would they make any adjustments on SGA. I don't think there's any adjustments that could be made. He's still going to get his, you know, right around 25, maybe even you know pushing 30. Um, on I don't know. I, I so they, I mean, you mentioned the the Valentinus thing with him. Uh, you know, muscling on on Holmgren, but if the shots start going in for Chet, then that takes him off the floor. So I mean, you kind of only already answered your question with how defensive changes could be made going smaller if the Thunder is able to hit their shots. And I wonder if they go that quicker to try to frustrate the Thunder uh, from uh, from their mid range and, and beyond. You know, the, Herb Jones has obviously done a really good job against SGA throughout the season. And I, I'm sure that they trust him to kind of slow SGA down as much as whatever that means. But you have to wonder, what what have we seen other teams do that have kind of frustrated not only the Thunder, but especially SGA? And that is like blitzing him as soon as he comes across the line to get the ball out of his hands. Then that, of course, forces somebody else to either make a play or somebody else to make a shot. I wonder if they kind of go to a little bit more of that instead of just Herb Jones trying to lock up SGA. And maybe not, maybe not, you know, every other or every fifth possession throughout the game, but especially if this game is close in the last few minutes, instead of letting Shea, you know, pick his matchup like he did in that that one the and one possession by getting the switch to to McCollum and then of course the and one in the lane, I wonder if they just say, you know what, I don't care who it is. But somebody else is beating us besides Shea Gildas Alexander and forcing the ball out of his hands in those key possessions late, I think is something that if I'm Mark Dagnalt and, and Shea, I'm I'm probably preparing for tonight where they're not just gonna let you dribble it around the top of the key for twenty seconds and then get in the lane and score. Yeah. And and that makes sense. Uh, that's what if it was the other way around and, and you know, the the Pelicans had somebody like Shea. That's what I'd be saying, too. Don't let their best player beat you, especially down the stretch. And I think, unfortunately, in game one, Shea wasn't his normal efficient self, but down the, down the stretch, when they really had to have a bucket, Shea was able to get it. And, mm-hmm. and I, think that, yeah. I, I don't think they're going to allow that, at least as much as they possibly can to get that ball out of his hands. So then the playmaking of J-Dub becomes huge. The shot-making of, of a Dort or of a Wiggins or even Chet – becomes paramount down the stretch of, of a close game tonight if that transpires because I, I, I think they're going to make somebody else beat them. And, that, yep. and that's what I would do too, yep. without a doubt. Game, uh, game two, 8.30, right here on the Sports Animal, 7 o'clock for the pregame show, and then, of course, 8.30 for game two's tip. Hanging out here on a Wednesday, Boomtown Grill. The Boomtown Grill yesterday. Did you go get you a five dollar chicken fry? That was this Tuesday special. Tomorrow, the Thursday special is those fifty cent boneless chicken wings. So today it's just a normal day. Happy hour from two to six. That's Monday through Friday. We've got twelve big screen TVs, appetizers, drink specials, eleven beers on tap, thirty bottles and cans available. What a perfect place to go down and enjoy thundering up. At the Boomtown Grill tonight. Watch some NBA playoff action. Of course, tomorrow you can sneak in there for the 50-cent boneless wings and the NFL draft. It's not just those specials. They've got pizzas. They've got pastas. They've got burgers and sandwiches. They've even got, I mean, you're talking about the, if you're a health nut. they got it for you. Salads. Grilled chicken. Maybe a steak salad. they got everything at the Boomtown Grill. 2103 South Main in Elk City. Open seven days a week, 11 to 10. Sunday through Thursday, and then 11 to 11 on Friday and Saturday. Okay, Jared, so going into the break, I previewed the guessing game that we're going to play. Adam Schefter tweeted this out over the the drafts from 2000 to 2019, so a 20-year span. Which positions have been the most reliable on hitting on a first-round draft pick? And what hit means is... You draft a player in the first round, and that player signs a second contract with you. That is hit. Now, yeah, there's obviously different sample sizes to this because of the amount of players at a certain position, right? That would be uh, t- 
taken, you know, in -hmm. the draft. I mean, there's going to be less of this than, than, than that. But this is based on just pure percentage points only. So if I said, Jared, which position has the best percentage of hits in that 20-year span in the first round of the NFL draft, what would you say? Uh, and this is broken might, down by literally not just a group. I'm talking about position. Right. I'm I'm going to I'm going to really overanalyze this because the heart and soul of your team, your quarterback, I'm not going to say quarterback, but I will say when they're breaking down, when they're analyzing, trying to find the best fit for this position to keep guys like your quarterback healthy, keep them upright, make the pass, all the stuff, control the game. I'll say guard, left guard. Okay, so guard and Blind, tackles. I'm thinking blindside is right. where I'm going. Yeah, they, so. they didn't break it clear down to that. Oh, uh, okay. So it's like guard so and tackle. Guard, tackle, yeah. Yeah. Uh, guards have a 50% hit rate. 28 were drafted in the first round. 14 hit. 14 miss that is third overall oh so well that's a really good guess that's about par for me third place third place now <laughs> listen there are one two i think there's 12 one two three four five six seven eight nine ten yeah there's 12 positions okay so i mean you're in the top f- fourth with that guess guard 50 percent only i think of someone i mean like i think I, you know oh i, I forgot I, to ask you wait Going into this, what do you think the Cowboys should do at 24? Before you know these answers. Offensive line. Okay. Well, you're not going to change your opinion, I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, there are three positions that that have a better than 50% hit rate. Number one, by leaps and bounds, is centers. I almost went there. I almost went 11 there. of 12. There was only 12 drafted in the in that 20 year span. But 11 of them hit. One missed. So that's 92% hit rate for the center. You guess guard which is third, the other over 50% is offensive tackle. So the offensive line was the only ones that had 50% or better hit rates. Uh offensive tackle, they were 38 out of 64, which is 59%. See, I, I also was thinking offensive line. You know, I was thinking of guys like, uh, well, Kelsey, who just retired from the Eagles. Um, you know, Lane Johnson's another one. Like Creed Humphrey over at yeah, Kansas but they City. he wasn't a first rounder. Though. I know. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. First round. Yeah, it had to be my first bad, rounders. My bad. But still, you're right. Wait, I mean, what? just think about the Cowboys. That's why I kind of brought them up, the, them up in this, because think about some of the picks they've made that nobody liked at the time. They have taken four first-round offensive linemen. Tyron Smith, and, and they're on all levels of this. Tyron Smith, Travis Frederick, who's the center, Zach Martin, who's the guard, and then Tyler Smith from Tulsa, mm-hmm. who's playing guard. Those all appear to be hits. Well, three of them already are. Hell, two of them might be Hall of Famers with, Smith, with Tyron and also Zach Martin. So at least the Cowboys' first round drafts have built this out exactly right, because they all, they've got hits on all three levels. Unless did Frederick ever sign a second contract because he got hurt? I can't remember. He might be the miss, but he wasn't a miss. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. You know. All right. So offensive line is the only ones over fifty percent. Now there's a group of four of these positions. That were somewhere in the 40s. Say that again. There's there's four group four positions that are somewhere in the 40s, either four from 40 to 49 percent hit rate. Let's go to the other side, a defensive tackle or a defensive line. Okay, so that it's it's separated out from tackle to edge rusher. Both are there. Both are at the bottom of it. Okay. Uh, defensive tackle at 40%, 24 out of 60. Edge rushers at 44%, 46 of 104. 
There's two others. One of which is surprising to me. I'll stay on defense and cornerback. Nope. No. Linebacker. Linebacker. Linebacker is 48%. 24 out of 50. And then the other one, and this surprises me because and I, you know, it's stacked toward the first of this century instead of now. And so I think probably if you if you do the next 20 years, I don't think this I don't think this position will be as high as they are right now because of the lack of money you have to pay out of the draft. And that's quarterback. Think about in t- up until Sam Bradford got drafted. Teams weren't near as willing to take flyers in the middle to late part of the first round on these quarterbacks because they had to pay him so much, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously yeah. Bradford was the last one that got that mega, mega contract as, as, a first, as the number one overall pick. And so it probably I, – I think this number has gone down as these 20 years have gone on. Because teams are now willing to take to take more risks because you don't have to blow up your cap for a guy you don't even know if he can play yet. Right. But quarterbacks are 46%. 26 out of 56. But like I said, I think that number will go down as teams, you know, 15 years ago, New England ain't drafting. I mean, I get that they had Brady. But New England ain't drafting Mac Jones on a flyer at 15. They're waiting until the second or third round to take that flyer. Now they don't care because it doesn't hamstring you by missing. Mm -hmm. Hell, Arizona took back-to-back first-round quarterbacks. Josh Rosen decided he wasn't the answer and then picked Kyler number one. You would have never saw that in the the pre-Bradford era. That would never happen. You probably wouldn't have taken Josh Rosen in the first round anyhow if you had any doubts on him. You'd wait. So a uh, quarterback surprising, but I think that it'll get down to where we all would think it might be as it goes on. And then the the ones that have been less than forty percent, quarterback or corner, running back, safety, and then the the last two, tight end and receiver. Wide receiver is the least hit position of first round draft picks in the NFL draft in those in, from twenty. For 2000 to 2019, 21 out of 77, 27%. I wonder if that one will be the inverse of the quarterbacks. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Because, man, it it, it feels like at least right now, and maybe it's just the, the, the bias of time in this space, but it, it's, of course, I say that, and Tyreek didn't do it. Of course, he wasn't a first-round pick. But, you know, Devontae Smith has already re-signed for a second deal. Everybody's waiting on CD. You know, are you going to see Jamar Chase and, and, and Jefferson and those? You know, it, it feels yeah. like those – maybe it's just that draft class <laughs> or right through there. But it, it seems like that, you know, receiver is going to be a, one that kind of climbs the ladder because of the importance of them. Well, I thought it was really interesting that – you know, a lot of times when you when you start seeing the grades, like coming out on Friday, first round grades will be handed out by all the draft gurus and this and that. And inevitably, somebody that took an offensive lineman when they could have taken the you know, the what do you want to call it, the flashy pick, and instead they took a lineman, they'll get about a D plus. Then about four years from now you'll go, Boy, I mean th- Cowboys is a perfect example. Everybody's up in arms. When they t- the, when they picked some guard out of Notre Dame named Zach Martin instead of Johnny Manziel, and my God, was that a great draft pick? <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. But the offensive linemen, the only position groups, and all three pieces of the offensive line were the only ones above fifty percent hit rate. It's pretty incredible to actually see that on paper. That was an Adam Schefter tweet from last night. Hmm. So. Obviously, I'm going to go ahead and guess that if you fought offensive line going in for the Cowboys at 24, once you see that actual data, changes your your mind zero. I mean, it's a need, right? I think it's a need, and I also think that if it goes the way a lot of these mock drafts are going, 
not only is it a need, but also you're going to have guys in that area where you're drafting that fill a need while also giving you great value because they're 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 a higher position on your draft board than what you're picking at. Yeah, so it's a win-win, but I, I, it is a need. Now, who that could be, I don't know. I was watching a deal last night, kind of in between games and and this and that. The guy from Barton from Duke. Mm. So the Cowboys, they kind of need two things. They kind of they need a tackle, and they need a center. Guess what? He did them both. So maybe you know maybe you can. Sort of kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, yeah, figure out where to put them. Yeah, which which spot he's better at once yeah. you get him. It, that that would be one. I, I think you know when you look down through it, Tyler Guyton from OU is going to be in that area. I think Amarius Mims from Georgia is going to be in that area. Um, the other center, he's got two last names. I can't remember what his name. He, I think he'll be in that area of, of possibilities. Now, that seems like the smart play. Jordan Morgan, is that you're thinking of? No, no. It, it's something Johnson. Uh, oh, oh, it's hyphenated thing? Yes. I'd have to find out. Uh, anyway, yeah. that would be the smart play. But is that what you want to do? Well, on the other side of it, I mean, there's been a lot of talk that they need a third wide receiver. I get the feeling that Dallas thinks they already got their third wide receiver somewhere on, already on their roster. But there's a whole Dak situation. Mm-hmm. You know, do you and and do they and there's been a lot of talk. You know Stephen A Smith wants them to draft a quarterback cuz I think it's dumb and he he loves to, to for them to make dumb decisions, but he thinks it's time to find the successor for Dak. I don't necessarily disagree hmm. because I don't, I don't trust anything that comes out of Stephen A's mouth when well, he talks about the Cowboys. He I just wants too. them to burn. Oh, I know. So there's no serious reporting when it comes to him talking about the Cowboys. He just rips on them. So when he says that, I'm like, okay, whatever. That means they shouldn't do it. If you knew you could get Michael Penix in the second round, I think you would draft offensive line. But is, is that a is that an is that even a possible replacement? I wouldn't hate it. Because here's the thing. I'm done with Dak. I'm done with him. And so eventually you're going to have to take his replacement. And when you look at what's coming next year in the draft, it's not as good as this. And if you plan on being pretty good, you're going to be kind of in the same spot with le- with a less talented pool to pick from. It wouldn't hurt my feelings if they drafted Michael Penix. I would shoot. I would. I would. I would cuss the moon if they picked Bo Nix. If you're going to pick Bo Nix, just pick an offensive lineman and wait till about the fourth round and pick Spencer Rattler or somebody like that or Michael Pratt from Tulane. One of those. Any stock in the fact that Trey Lance is on this roster? Yeah, it doesn't seem like they even care. And and, and the problem is, you're not really ever going to get to see him because Dak's there, and their contracts are are concurrent when they run out. That was the dumbest part about that trade was they drafted a guy that could have been a jumping off point for a for a, le- a, a lot lesser price tag, except for they're at the same time. The Cooper Rush is just too old at this point. Yeah, Cooper Rush is Cooper. I'm whatever. I mean, he's, he's not going to lead a, he's you. A, he's a great backup quarterback. He's not leading you to a Super Bowl <laughs> no. championship. But, you know, that I'm sure the guy, nobody's wanting to turn loose of a guy that was young enough to, to make that make sense. But, yeah, Trey Lance was in like two drafts later. That's a perfect trade because then you can let Dak play the season out. Don't pay him yet. See what happens. If you don't like him, then you've got a young choice for two years that's already been in your system for two. Now they've got a young guy that's never going to play, has been in the system for two years, and you got Dak, who nobody wants to pay $60 million to. So they've kind of forced their hand into making this choice, possibly, tomorrow night. So we'll see. I don't think they're going to do it, by the way, but I wouldn't hate it. Because at least it gives you a let Dak leave, yep. and, you, and you sort of have something there that, that might work. Yep. Okay, Jared. I think I finally found 
a couple of good things about the NIL. You did, did you? I think I found two things that are positives about the NIL. Okay. Paying players isn't one of them. Because it's clearly back to the wild, wild west. Oh, it's like yeah. Southwest Conference in the late seventies, early eighties. <laughs> yeah, with what's going on. It's not how it's, it's not what it was designed to do, but it is what it is. But number one, the return of the video game NCAA college football. Mm. Yeah, that is coming back. That's one, and then number two apparently has happened today, according to Pete uh, to Pete Thamel, the Heisman Trophy trust or the down i guess it's not the downtown athletic club anymore a heisman trophy trust is finally returning reggie bush's 2005 heisman trophy their statement basically said with the changing landscape in college football you know essentially why he got it taken away is legal now that's right so Reggie Bush getting that Heisman Trophy back. You agree with it? 100%. 100%. I thought it was ridiculous that he ever gotten taken away. And here's why. And I think the timing of this is really, really interesting. Because they took Reggie Bush's Heisman away because his parents got to have a $300,000 house. They didn't take O.J. Simpson's away when he killed two people. Allegedly, now come on. Yeah, OJ. I was gone when that when he died. <laughs> Poor guy, never got to figure out who the killers were. You know that was his quest. As soon as he got out, was to go find who the killers were somewhere on a golf course in Florida. I was really hoping the, the days after he passed away that we were going to hear that he confessed on his deathbed. Yeah, he's way too narcissistic for that. Yeah, I know. But Reggie Bush, death. Do you agree? Now I do because of the changing of the rules and everything. But I, I'm a guy. I'm a rule follower. So did I? I it, and I've I approach everything like this. Are there rules and laws that I agree with? Absolutely not. But I follow them. And so I have a problem with people that go that are up in arms. Like, well, listen, he broke a rule that was in place that he knew about. Was it a good rule? No. But I, 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 but since this has all changed, the landscape of college football has all changed, I, I agree that he should have got it back, and I'm, I'm glad he did. So, yeah. Because we him, all remember that season, man. It well, was absolutely. one of the all-time greats, and he deserved, he deserves to hold on to that Heisman. And here's my thing. Yes, we know about what he did. How many of those Heisman winners do you think did the same thing he did or, or more? Right. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Just he happened to And he kind of – and it came caught. upon a time where – uh, help me with the year. Was it 05? 05 is it when was, he won it. You know, I mean, we, the internet was, I mean, people were getting more vocal on the internet with mm-hmm. Facebook or MySpace at the time or whatever it was. It, it, everything was becoming more transparent whether you liked it or not. And so it was becoming more in the light of all that, those transgressions or whatever, sure. the breaking of the rules then. But you're right. There is a ton of that. I mean, there's more egregious stuff happening with past Heisman winners. We all know that's true. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. I mean, as far as what he did. He wasn't the only Heisman winner that got paid some money right. to go play college right. football. Right. So, Reggie Bush Heisman back in his possession, apparently, according to Pete Thamel. Now, I wonder how long before we see it in a Wendy's commercial. Oh, think about all the cool ideas Wendy's can have now <laughs> at the Heisman house. That's exactly right. Oh, Heisman house. Uh, they could have Wendy's so many yes. fun, they, fun, fun things. Yeah. With yeah. all these By dudes. the way, those Wendy's commercials during the March Madness was awesome. I thought they were great. My kids loved them. They'd get it for a buck, get it yeah. for a buck. Dave Single, Dave. You're welcome, Wendy's. Just had to have the app. Uh, okay, <laughs> collegiate golf yesterday, the uh, Great American Conference Championships wrapped up at Forest Ridge in Broken Arrow. The Swasu men ended up fifth place. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Swatsu men ended up fourth place behind Henderson State, Harding, and Southern Arkansas. Sutton McMillan tied for fourth overall as an individual, uh, shooting four over through the through the three rounds. He shot two under yesterday to vault up the board, only three shots behind the winner. And then the ladies, the Lady Dogs, 
finished third, a shot out of second. Uh, Henderson State beat everybody pretty good, and then Harding was second. It's at, uh, one shot ahead of Swass. Lady Bulldogs had two in the top six. Uh, Freya Sala was two shots back. She finished in a four-way tie for second, and then Cordell's Megan Brown, another shot back there, uh, finishing in sixth. Meg was a uh, GAC all-first teamer again, and she uh, obviously proved her – uh, the reasoning for that there in that conference tournament. So both those teams, I think, headed to regionals, and we'll kind of follow that as we move along throughout the end of the coll- collegiate golf season. Also, Big 12 Men's Championship, last round underway at Whispering Pines down at Trinity, Texas. Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, top three. The Horns, uh, just a couple of guys on each team have teed off this morning. Horns own a 10-shot lead over OU. The Sooners have cut one off of that. As uh, they both guys that have teed off for Oklahoma, Stephen Campbell and Luke Kluver, have both birdied the first hole. So OU's cut one one shot off, but still down ten to Texas OSU. As another three shots back of OU, those uh, three teams are in the final uh, threesome playing at Whisper, uh, Whispering Pines. More importantly, as far as locally goes, uh, true freshman Ryder Cowan, who's been a guest on this show before. He is tied for eighth currently, hadn't teed off yet, at three under par. Ryder shot one under the first round on Monday. Backed that up with a uh, three over par round in the afternoon. Then yesterday, bogey free five under 67 to lead the Sooners um, way up the board. I think they moved up three or four spots yesterday as a team uh, behind uh, Ryder 67. So. Uh, he'll have a chance to finish in the top five in the conference tournament. Uh, let's see what the lead is. Lead is eight under. It'd be hard to, you know, you need uh, Ty Gingrich is the leader from Cincinnati individually. Probably need him to to back up just a little, and if Ryder can fire another five under out there at him, you never know. Maybe he's the individual conference champ. But uh, more importantly, I think, uh, see if OU or OSU, either one, can make a run at the horns as uh, Texas is really. Uh, their, their round yesterday was the best of the tournament at 13 under. And they went uh, vaulting to the top of the leaderboard, and they've got a pretty su- substantial lead over OU and OSU. Awesome. It is awesome. And Megan Brown is pretty cool. Yeah, Meg, was, Meg she's been really, really good. Uh, just a, a, a tough day on Tuesday when it was real windy. Kind of put her she, – she had the lead after round one. A tough day on Tuesday put her behind the eight ball a little bit. But, uh, yeah, she's been uh, – she'll have a chance – Lady Dogs have a chance to make it through the regional into the national tournament, and if they don't, she'll have a chance playing well enough as maybe an individual. You know, hopefully it's the team, but if it's not, then you know the way she's been playing this spring in her final season there at Southwestern, uh, she's yeah she's been really really good, and obviously Ryder, cool stuff from a guy that has never you know all these are firsts for him as far as these different tournaments. Yeah, you know, and heading into the regionals and all that kind of stuff, and hopefully the nationals, and who knows from there. Uh, for OU, but it'd be a tough task for either OU or OSU to reel in Texas today. They'll, they'll need some help. The Horns will need to play a bad round, um, you know, closer to even par or maybe even over par in order for either OU or OSU to have any shot. It's just, a, it's too tough a course to be able to to just smoke it. But if you do play really well and the Horns start struggle a little bit, they're all in the same group. They all know what everybody's doing. So that probably helps OU or OSU if they can really get going here in the, uh, you know, by the time you make the turn, you'd be able to tell if there's any chance or if it's just going to be kind of a cakewalk for Texas into the Big 12 title. But we'll be watching that for sure. Um, there's also a little bit of baseball coming up on the high school ranks in the regionals. I know Leedy is at Kiowa. That's been moved up today uh, for the first day. Kiowa, Covington, Douglas is at 11. Leedy and Lomega at 130. You know, then the winners will play, the losers will play. Then also Canute. Down in Caddo, right? Yeah. Caddo plays Bingeroni at 11. Canute plays Depew at 130. So both of those have been moved up. I know I talked to to Rappo Butler there. Stay in put as far as the days. They've got a little bit of change for the baseball on Wednesday with game times moving earlier. And that's probably just to maybe get it over with and send, you know, people get to go home, you know, some of that stuff. But uh, they've made adjustments to some times on Wednesday or on Friday, excuse me, but not as far as changing days completely. There's probably a bunch of that going on, honestly, all across the state. But we've got that today. And then, of course, uh, the, the Elkettes Regional Golf Tournament at Elk City Golf and Country Club going on right now 
We'll have updates throughout the day on BigElkTV.com. See some video highlights, manage the, the uh, scoreboard, and as the Elkats try to make it into the state tournament that will be held, I think it's at Weatherford, um, next week. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so we'll have uh, updates there on Big Elk TV for those state tournament uh, for the uh, regional tournament on the golf. And then, of course, tomorrow, Big Elk Baseball right here at Ackley Park, hosting regionals, have a one thirty and a 4 o'clock game. Purcell and then McLeod. So we've got lots of stuff coming on the high school spring sports kind of finale to the seasons uh, for the Elkettes, the Big Elks. You know, there's golf, there's baseball, there's tons of stuff rolling along. We'll have it all right here on the daily. Thunder prediction: win, lose, win. Easier than game one? Yeah, I think they settled down tonight and they win it. And the spread seven and a half. I think they cover it. I can see it being a double-digit win for Oklahoma City. Here, right here, 8.30, 7 o'clock for the pregame. Everybody have a great Wednesday. You've been listening to the Skinny on Sports podcast with Aaron Cow. Be sure to hit that subscribe button to get alerts of when the latest podcast is available. Thanks for listening. That ball is blistered to right. Way.